Um, during the break, uh, I gather we can uh, join in the, what is it called? In Wander uh, as uh, the coffee break space. Alva Alvaro, anything you need to say on that? He's quiet, so anyway. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, let's from NVIDIA, and he's going to talk about exploring new hardware and software with it with NWCAM. Um, he definitely is uh, taking a late start, a uh, late end to his day today, uh, call, calling in from Europe. So, Jeff, take it away at about the 20 ish minutes. I'll, I'll let you know that uh, you're where you are. Okay. Um, and I naturally, I, I will be logging off after the talk, but you can hit me on Slack if there are questions that I don't get to in the first round. I, I spend a lot of time on Slack. Um, yeah. So for the, for anybody who's not familiar with me, I, so I, I, I got my PhD working with Carol Kowalski on NWCAM and I've been working on it for 15 years now. Um, I've been at Argonne, I've been at Intel and I've joined NVIDIA in April um, or March, and um, and I moved to Finland in July. So I, that's for good. So that's why I'm here. Um, all right. So some of you know a lot about NWCAM. I, I'm sure there are some of you who don't know much at all. Uh, so for very high level background, um, NWCAM is a big package. Uh, it's got over a million lines of human written code and over 4 million lines of um, total code. Um, 3 million lines from the TC code generator, of course. So um, DFT, MP2, couple cluster, multi-scale stuff, QMMM embedding, uh, plane wave stuff, you know, not, not like VAST, but slightly different application domain, but similar capability. Um, it's massively parallel in the definition of the, of the day in which it was created, which is, you know, uh, multi-processing, um, multi nodes net with networks and and we'll see obviously there's a lot of changes in that space over the last few years um so it's written based on global arrays um and which is now based on mpi um so anyways um i'm going to talk about um a couple couple of new things that i do uh, one of the things i do when i i take a new job at a computer company is i spend a great deal of time with nwchem and breaking things uh, measuring things, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I gave a slightly longer version of this talk at NERSC a couple of years ago, which you can read about at the link if, if you really care about NWCAM history. Um, one thing I, I like to share, um, which makes me feel terribly old, even though I was I was 11 in 1992 when NWCAM was created, but but NWCAM is older than some of you on the phone, I'm sure. Um, but it's easy to look at NWCAM through today's eyes of software and, and find all sorts of things that are wrong uh, with NWCAM. Um, and that's fair, but it's, it's really useful to understand the world in which NWCAM was born and understand how design decisions were made and how things evolved because the world of 30 years in the future will not be the software world we have today. And I know some of you probably think that C++ 20 is the greatest programming model in history and everything will be perfect forever or Python or whatever. Um, but in 30 years, um, everything you've designed today is going to look bad. So, you know, try to hedge your bets and, um, and, and design in some level of uh, modularity and adaptability to future systems. So this is just a list of things. You know, today we take Linux and MPI and Fortran 90 um, and C++ and OpenMP for granted. Um, and the only thing that existed when NWCAM was created was POSIX. And it wasn't even called POSIX until like right before NWCAM was uh, born. Uh, Fortran 90 existed as a standard, um, but there were no decent compilers for many years. And there wasn't a proper open source compiler um, until right around the time I got started. So, you know, you can't build a software package if the only compiler cost two grand and, 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 you know, comes from a mainframe company or whatever. So this is the world and NWCAM designed around all of these things. And even though those, these mitigations are no longer necessary, the philosophy behind them has been valuable. And this will be illustrated when I get to ARM. Um, 
because it turned out NWCM just worked on ARM because NWCM had for its entire history been adapting to novel architectures and ARM was nothing special compared to all the other chips that NWCM had run on. Whereas, you know, there's many other codes today that, that you know, make a bunch of really aggressive assumptions about the platform and, and don't work on ARM or don't work on um, things that aren't Linux or Ubuntu. The other one, of course, hardware changes. And this is why standards matter. Um, you know, there's this thing attacking the killer micros um, and basically uh, killed off almost every computing company building specialized hardware in the 90s. Um, so if you look at all of history, um, Fujitsu, HP, and IBM are the only continuously operating HPC system vendors. And you could argue at some level that there were some interruptions there. IBM's not particularly active right now, and HP has had its, had its ins and outs. And Fujitsu's obviously been continuously operating within you know, a geographically con constrained market. Um, but this is another reason, you know, you want, you don't want to write your code for thinking machines, uh, Fortran or for, you know, Cray, Cray custom features, um, cause you never know when your company is going to go away. So ARM, uh, why ARM? Uh, maybe this is obvious enough, but these are all cool things, um, now and in the future. Uh, some of these things are little toys I have in my basement, like, uh, the Raspberry Pi and the Xavier and the Rock Pro, um, other things are an essential part of the digital economy, like Graviton, that's, you know, big part of AWS. And then there's, you know, CPU technology that will, you know, like Ampere that's going into various clouds. There's obviously A64FX in the Fugaku machine that's amazing. Um, the greatest PC ever created is, is the M1. Um, M1 Max is, is insane. Um, and then uh, two of the things that I'm working on uh, very hard are uh, the NVIDIA ARM roadmap, which we have a dev kit out there you can read about that's, you know, our, the Ampere CPU with an A100 in it, or a couple A100s, um, and then some ARM cores on the DPU if you're, if you're into that. Um, and then the thing we've announced that's coming down the line is this thing called Grace, which is um, an absolutely ridiculous server CPU that um, I can't tell you anything more than what's on the internet. So, um, I ported NWCAM to ARM in 2014, but that really wasn't work. What I did is I had an ARM system and I verified that NWCAM worked because NWCAM tends to work well on new things. Um, the only things that were problematic in those days were BLAS libraries, mostly because ARM was really new and ARM wasn't really good at double precision floating point and there was some simple problems. Um, there may have been some other issues that I, in optional dependencies, but, but they weren't an issue. So, so the fact is, ARM has never been a problem for NWCAM, but of course we want to know how well things work. That, that's what matters. So um, I have spent a bunch of time this year on this. Um, I haven't fixed every compiler issue. Fujitsu has some problems and I don't care because um, there's too many Fortran compilers that I care about more. Um, there's some various issues with various Cray machines that have more to do with packaging than, than actual technology. Um, and other than that, there's basically no issues. All the BLAS libraries work. Um, Mac works. Um, Mac M1 was, I think, one line code change in the build system and one macro change in, in the source code. Um, the only interesting thing I think that's left to be done with ARM was an SV port of the Cement integral code. Um, we'll see if that happens. But that's that's the sort of important thing one needs for, for any new architecture is, is vectorized libraries where, when, they, when they can be made. So um, I'm gonna just show some very, I would say mundane performance experiments in the sense that I'm gonna run the NWCAM DFT code with a bunch of tuning parameters um, and tell you what matters and what doesn't, um, just so you have an understanding of the sensitivity because you know I have lots of free time to do these measurements, not everybody does. So you know the biggest variables in the performance NWCAM um, of the DFT code, at least, is usually the is usually global arrays. Um, in some limits, scalar pack will matter, or blas will matter, but but in most limits, it doesn't. Um, and, and and in general, the most of the time, the compiler isn't isn't really making a huge transformation on the code to, to go one way or the other. Um, but it's nice to verify this. So I ran with our compilers, the NVIDIA, formerly known as PGI compilers, and GCC. Um, those are the ones that are free. And I can install on all my machines. There's also ARM, P, ARM, ARM compilers out there and Cray on some systems, et cetera. 
Um, but I don't have great compilers in my basement, so I don't I don't use it very often. And I compared MPitch and OpenMPI because why not? Um, and then both versions of RMC. Um, I have more of a, more experience with RMC MPI. I, I helped write it, um, but I contribute to both and don't care who wins. I just want one that goes one one or more that goes fast. Um, I have a code generator for benchmarking. You can find the link there if you want to run NWCAM and don't want to think about input files. Go for it. Um, it's it's kind of useful for that for benchmarking. So uh, this is the performance on with the ARM tool chain de de uh, dependency. So you see this stair step is the process count. I'm sorry, I suck at Microsoft Excel. I didn't know how to make better pictures than this. So I'm sorry if you don't like it. Um, you could take a screenshot and use a ruler later or whatever, or I can send you the raw data if you, if you want that. Um, but what you see here is everything scales. And the performance is roughly the same across the board. You'll see about a 10% plus or minus. Um, the biggest performance difference you will see is between ARM CMPI and MPI PR at low process count. That is completely straightforward. Um, MPI PR, the PR stands for process rank. What it means is ARMC steals one of the cores for communication. That's a great thing. It's part of you know, asynchronous design. It's been in ARMC since the beginning. Um, ARM CMPI has that as an option, um, which I didn't turn on because shared memory doesn't usually need it. MPI PR has it in there all the time. So of course, if you're on 10 cores and you lose one, you're gonna lose 10%. Um, at 80 cores, it doesn't make a bit of difference. The difference between 79 and 80 or 63 and 64 doesn't matter. Um, so you see here, you know, compilers are about between a two and a 7% effect. Um, MPitch versus OpenMPI was, you know, maybe 5%. Some of that has to do with, you know, who's, who's doing a better job with uh, POSIX shared memory, um, you know, protocol tuning and, and other stuff. Obviously, multi-node, much more complicated. Um, I didn't want to mess around with that because I didn't have all the hardware with all the networks and it's really hard to get that, those sorts of studies right. Um, but, you know, the good news is things are pretty stable. So you don't have to worry about using our compiler or using a special BLAS library or special MPI on ARM, you just use you use whatever you like. It doesn't matter, um, at least not, not to more than 10%. The BLAS libraries will, will matter uh, if you configure them wrong, um, but, but ARM is not as strongly dependent on, on vector performance as some other chips. So um, here's the bake off. Um, I don't have Ice Lake in the lab. Um, I have Milan in the lab, um, but it's a 32 core part. So I've done the benchmarking on Rome, top bin Rome, uh, top bin Ampere Ultra Q80. Um, although there is the, 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 the Ultra Max, which I have numbers for, but turns out isn't, isn't favorable for this for NWCM. Um, and then a relatively old Xeon. So the numbers here, you can see pretty clearly. Um, at the lowest core count, Intel does the best. They put a lot of effort into single core performance and, and they put a lot of turbo into that thing. Um, obviously it's a 20 core chip. So um, after you get, get out of ways, um, you, ru you run out of cores and then you of course don't scale any faster. Um, the epic numbers scale all the way down. Um, Ultra is, you know, starts out behind and then catches up. Um, the, the ARM Neoverse core that's in the Ultra has a smaller die area. And so you could put more of them on the same package and you could power more of them for the same watts. And so you catch up. So, you know, you see here, um, x86 is still a little bit better, especially if you care about single core performance. Um, and this is of course, you know, a lot more maturity in a lot of the software. Um, but you see, you know, this is not this is not the ARM you know if you've been using Raspberry Pi. This is not the ARM embedded ARM of days of old. Ne Neoverse is very much a, um, you know, a, a competitive server core, and that's of course Neoverse N1, which is a couple of years old. There's now N2 and V1 um, coming down the line in in various places. Um, some of which I could say, some of which I can't. <coughs> so. Um, NWCAM ran out of the box. Um, I think, you know, that that should have been expected, but it's always nice to verify it. Um, you know, parenthesis T and couple cluster is going to be more blast uh, sensitive. And I've got those running in terminals and I, I'll have the data eventually. Um, but it's about tracking with DGEM performance and bandwidth as one would might expect. So, you know, hopefully what you take away from this is, you know, ARM is boring in the best possible way. 
which is that unless you are critically dependent on Intel software that will never run on ARM, um, you're going to be just fine. It doesn't really matter. Use open source tools um, or use NVIDIA compilers which support all the CPUs. It doesn't matter. Um, MPI is fine. Open Blas, Bliss, et cetera, are fine. Um, just because maybe some folks in the audience care more recently, I've tried some of the some of my other favorite codes, C4 and Dalton. Um, and there were slightly more issues. Um, part of this is because the, they don't qualify their binaries with NVIDIA compilers as much as um, NWChem does. Um, and they use some things that are slightly less portable. So they use 128-bit reels. Uh, don't do that if you want portability, um, although, or at least make it optional. Um, Type-bound procedures, that's our compiler's fault. It'll be fixed sometime next year. Um, and then, of course, don't violate the Fortran standard. Just because it works with iFort and GFortran does not mean it's portable code. Um, so I'm working on fixing that stuff uh, because I like big Fortran codes and, um, and think they should work everywhere. So um, hold on, what's the question? Uh, why is Blas? Oh, well, Blas is not so important to B3LIP because it's mostly atomic integrals. Um, thank you for answering whoever did that. Okay, so now I'm talking about GPUs a little bit. Um, obviously that's part of my day job now. Um, so uh, CCSD parenthesis T is probably very, very familiar to some of you, less so to others. Um, basically after lots and lots of transformations from LaTeX into Fortran, one ends up um, having as the bottleneck tensor contractions that are in the red boxes. Um, Carol Kowalski, Shriam, Krishnamurthy and others have written a lot of papers about this particular code. Um, so I won't go into detail. You can read about that stuff, grab the PDFs or, or read the code because it's, it's readily available. Um, and so I'm gonna show you what I did with GPU porting of this stuff um, in March. So just for, for background, um, there's a lot of work on this. I know there's probably been at least one MOLSI or NSF workshop on this on tensors. Um, there's a lot of smart people out there who've done great work. You can read their stuff. Um, NWChem has gone back and forth between a transpose, transpose, DGEM transpose implementation and a loop-based implementation. This is because some of the time the, the former, which uses GEM and therefore is efficient in a flop sense, the excessive transposes can be a problem. And so sometimes NWCAM doesn't do the most efficient transpose strategy and it's better to just use loops. The other thing, of course, for me, that's interesting about loop code is loop code is completely general. And the things that I learn about loops um, on GPUs can be extended to just about anything. Um, whereas if you're talking about tensor contractions, that's applicable to, you know, couple cluster and GW you know, and machine learning and some other things, but but not everything in the world. Um, of course, there are other strategies like people use code generators, which requires you to pay the computer scientists to do the code generator, um, or there's libraries. You know, Devin Matthews has one, Dimitri Locke has another, um, and then NVIDIA, Paul Springer has developed CU Tensor, which is amazing. And I've been really happy to see that, that ecosystem emerge, you know, in, in the last couple of years. Um, but of course, none of those is perfectly universal um, and, and, you know, it'll be a while, but hopefully we'll get there. Um, but I'm using CU Tensor. Obviously, I work for NVIDIA. Um, I think the important lesson for this is, you know, if you're on an NVIDIA platform, please use CU Tensor. Um, otherwise, you know, use, use one of the others and hopefully cover all the space. Um, you can write loops and get the best you can do, um, or you can, you know, use somebody's library. And if they're smarter than you. Um, then you get their, their performance with less work, which is what I do. So this is the code. I hacked it a little bit. Um, some of it's standard violating uh, just to make slide code pretty. Um, so it's a seven dimensional loop nest with an inner product on the innermost dimension, uh, six dimensional array, outer product with two four dimensional arrays. If you do the math on this, um, you know, the tile size here is about 30. So the inner loop dimension is 30, which turns out to be not exactly compute bound. Um, you have to have an inner loop of at least a couple hundred to saturate um, a modern chip. I don't actually know the number on NVIDIA off the top of my head. I do know on Intel it's 384. Um, so, you know, if your tile size isn't 384, you're not hitting peak, uh, but you still want to go as fast as possible. And so um, knowing, you know, you could, Think about this from a loop roof line sense. 
um, you can go as fast as you can pull the data into memory. And those 30 flops are basically free unless you do something dumb. So what does this look like? Um, so this is do concurrent. I have some talks I'll cite at the end with more information. Um, do concurrent is part of Fortran 2008. Uh, NVIDIA has implemented it with a backend that runs on both CPU and GPU. The backend is actually OpenACC. Um, you don't have to know that. I just, that helps you understand how it, how it, some of the characteristics of how it works. We also use unified memory automatically under the hood. So you don't have to put in any directives for data movement. And this is really nice. So this here, other than writing Fortran 2008 do concurrent, which you know is GPU aware, other than knowing that it's GPU aware and writing a concurrent statement, there is nothing GPU specific or even GPU aware about this program. This will run on an NVIDIA GPU. And so that's cool that you don't have to use any directives, um, you know, either for controlling data or execution, um, which, which is really nice to be able to do this in standard Fortran. You can also replace the tensor transpose with an intrinsic. Probably many of you are, are old school Fortran programmers like me and don't even know that there's all these great intrinsics in Fortran that resemble NumPy, um, but they are there and we have implemented many of those intrinsics on GPUs. You can find out more in other talks that I'll cite at the end. Okay, so this is where we are and we're gonna see how does this perform compared to other things. All of this code is based upon a standalone driver uh, repo for the NWCAM triples kernels. It's on GitHub. You can grab it and it should work. If not, complain to me on GitHub. Um, and you could try this with anything out there. Um, so, you know, if you don't like the numbers or whatever, if you want to see more code, please, please check it out yourself. Um, and you don't have to build NWCAM to run these experiments, which is why the repo exists. So, um, finally, so this is CU Tensor. Um, and CU Tensor, when I first looked at it, was kind of intimidating. It did take me about four hours to write all of the parentheses T stuff in CU Tensor, but it's really beautiful because even though it's developed by a computer scientist in C, um, he was wise enough to make it column major. Um, so you see here on the right, you look at the loop body, and on the left, you look at the way you describe the contraction to CU Tensor, and they are in fact identical. So other than doing a whole bunch of copy pasta on 27 different terms, um, this was really quite easy once I got the sort of the setup uh, going for, for CU Tensor. And I will say there's a Fortran API too. I just chose to use the C API, um, but the version that will go into NWCAM will actually most likely use Fortran um, because it's better not to, not to have to think about which uh, C compiler you're using. So, um, the experiments, everything's run on an A100 DGX station um, with software, with our software from this summer. Um, and you can check out the, the, the repo tile size equals 30. That's all you need to know. So first thing here, I have um, the OpenMP CPU code, which has been around for a long time, and then the GPU code. So I wrote the do concurrent, aka standard parallel version, uh, OpenACC and OpenMP for GPUs. I worked on all of them. I wrote them all at the same time. Um, the OpenACC one is, is amazing. It uses ACC kernels, which is like the absolute laziest thing you could possibly do. Turns out when you use ACC kernels with Fortran, it works beautifully. Um, it just basically turns every loop into an, a parallel loop and then the compiler figures it out. Do concurrent does the same thing. OpenMP um, turns out to require more work. You have to tell the compiler more things. You have to remove statements that you might've added for other people's compilers. Um, so OpenMP was a little more performance unstable, uh, but eventually I got to the same place. So the important th thing about this figure is um, you don't have to pick a winner. Um, you have OpenACC, OpenMP, and Do Concurrent all perform about the same within some noise. And um, what that means is if you are going to use OpenMP because that's what DOE told you to do, great, write OpenMP. If you're using OpenACC because it's really well documented, and NVIDIA has supported it for a really long time and you like it, great, use OpenACC. If you want to live at the edge and do modern Fortran and do do concurrent, great, you don't compromise. So you can use all of these and get about the same thing. Um, now, um, these, you look at the performance, you see about 750 to uh, 1200 uh, gigaflops. So that's amazing from the standpoint, um, it's got a 20 teraflop peak, 
Um, so that's only five five percent of peak. But I also um, wrote most of this code in one day, um, and none of it has any awareness of GPUs um, or any GPU architecture. So it does say target offload, and it does say open ACC in those versions. But the fact is this code isn't optimized for anything. It's just parallel. So five to 10% of peak makes me happy if I, have, if I have to put in that level of work. So CU Tensor now on this figure bumps it up, um, goes almost up to five teraflops. So that's almost 25% of peak. Um, however, um, we don't get tensor cores or we don't utilize tensor cores effectively because the low floating point intensity of these kernels. So it's more like 10 teraflops peak. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're above a third of peak here. Um, and if you know the, you know, the roof line analysis on the, you know, the speed of light, we're basically moving as fast as we can pull data into the chip in order to get higher performance in these operations. You actually have to do some algorithmic transformations for fusion or for multi-level tiling, which Carol already implemented a couple of years ago, uh, but I haven't adapted that version to CU Tensor yet. Okay, um, so summary, uh, do concurrent in conjunction with unified memory uh, allows you to write reasonable GPU code with no GPU awareness. So that hasn't been true in the past in general, right? Um, I wrote CUDA one um, and it was crazy painful. Um, CUDA has gotten easier to write, but still isn't everybody's favorite thing to do. People like directives. Some people don't like directives or some people like one particular set of directives or vendors refuse to support both of them the way we do, um, in which case, you know, it'd be nice to not have to think about which directives and just go straight to Fortran. So, you know, do concurrent, of course, is new and not everybody supports it the same way. Um, it is, you know, limited to what compilers are doing. Um, our compiler has a really good GPU implementation. The CPU implementation is okay, but not as good as OpenMP um, just because of maturity. Um, I know some other vendors are getting interested or have a version that works well, like Intel Fortran does a fine job on CPUs. Um, they don't have a GPU version yet. Um, you should ask them for it if you like Fortran. Um, and of course, you know, CU Tensor is faster than anything that I can write um, in a day. Um, that's because Paul Springer got his PhD on this stuff. Um, it's silly not to use libraries when they exist. Um, I think CU Tensor is amazing and, you know, I'm glad that I work for NVIDIA now and I get to use it. Um, please check it out if, you know, rather than building your own Tensor library, if, if you haven't already done it. Um, and if you're using Tensor libraries, please, you know, include it in the, in the selection that you're, you're going to support. Um, so I, I listed these here because I, I only had a half an hour and I wanted to allude to recordings of things. If you want to know more about ARM, I have a talk where all I do is talk about ARM. I have a longer talk about NWCAM. I have a longer talk about Fortran, um, which expands on some of these points. And then if you're new and haven't really thought about GPU porting at all, I have a GTC talk that's really about starting with the very beginning and comparing which models um, might be compelling for your workload based upon their characteristics. So that's the end. Hopefully I got some time to answer questions. Um, and yeah. Fire away. Thank you, Jeff. We have a couple of minutes uh, for any questions. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand. Jack. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, yeah, th thanks, Jeff. That was a great talk. Um, I have one question about what you were talking about at the end in regards to Tensor. So it was, it was actually my, impress my impression that NWCAM really couldn't utilize Tensor because you wanted to get the advantages of like the like the symmetries uh, and like the basically the zeros in your tensors and tensor products and things like that. Is that is that true or can you no. really can you... so so the design of TCE the the symmetries are all implemented at the tile level. So there's this big fat distributed compute loop over 30 by 30 uh -huh. by 30 by 30 blocks. But then at the at the node level within a process, there's a completely dense contraction. Now, I will say in four dimensional space, the edges, the three dimensional edge of the, that tensor in that blocking space, there are some, there's some wasted compute, but it's 
it's basically one over n um, fraction, so it doesn't matter. But yeah, all those CCSD parentheses T calls are completely dense on a I given see. symmetry block. Um, yeah, so it's it's okay. not a problem. Okay, good to know. Thanks. Yeah, and I will say I haven't pushed it upstream, um, but I, I I told my boss I would do it in Q1, um, and I'll be you know I'll get my my pay cut or or increase based upon my delivery of that. So um, I should be I should have this stuff upstream in in Q1 um, if people want to check it. And you can have it right now. I mean, it's not hard to merge. I just I just don't know if I'll do it before Christmas. Okay. I think we're at the top of the hour. So, uh, Jeb, thank you. Thank you for being here late. And uh, let's go to our next speaker.